My name is Aaron Kammer. Uh, I work at a company called iRobot. We make Roombas, little things that track along the floor, clean your house. Um, we were founded a long time ago, 1990. They got into the defense and security business for a while. Um, Packbots, Cobras, the things that like diffuse IEDs and you throw them over a wall and see if terrorists are on the other side. Um, kind of very cloak and dagger, MacGyver type stuff. Um, but they also introduced the Roomba in 2002. And by 2015, they connected the Roombas to the cloud. Um, during the 2000s, the defense and security business kind of waned. They divested of it, and they're completely focused on the consumer business now. So this is about me. I'm Aaron. I was founded a little bit earlier. Um, don't do any math. I just had my birthday on Monday. It was worse than the last birthday. Um, I've been IT consulting for a long time, hopped over to iRobot in 2015 at the same time that they were cloud connecting their robots. And I manage the AWS implementation across the whole company. Um, but my primary focus for today is to talk about the cloud-connected ecosystem of our robots. Um, we'll also touch a little bit on some of the infrastructure, too. But you can contact me at my email. Um, so when you think about operations, I think about um, you know, like a sailing team or a sailor or a captain. You, know, you want these people to embody these qualities. You, know, you have to have good situational awareness. You have to be able to navigate changing landscapes and as the sea is throwing everything it can at you. You gotta be able to fix everything, like I said, MacGyver before, um, with the duct tape that you have in the hold. Um, and meet all of it very, very calmly with a cool head. Um, so here's our team at uh, iRobot. And uh, all I can say is don't bet things with people. Don't wager, uh, just in general. No matter how sure you are that uh, your favorite sports team is gonna win or some other outcome is going to happen, you're going to end up having to put a picture up like this of yourself. Um, so don't do that. We're not that bad, though. Um, so let's touch on why we're doing serverless with AWS, primarily for all the reasons everyone's talked about already, and we won't spend too much time on them. We can operate leaner. We can do faster POCs. We can skip the pain of learning how to do all the things that the sailors do that you saw at the beginning of the, of the presentation. Those guys know how to run. Uh, Linux, they know how to patch for security, they know how to do high availability, they know how to do backups, and they know how, all that stuff. We want to just stand on the shoulders of those folks. Um, we also want to save some money. Earlier today we heard people talking about getting charged for just what you use. That's fantastic. Um, when you start to have millions and millions of robots all talking at the same time and all wanting to do something, uh, getting charged for everything that they say may not be as uh, an exciting proposition. Um, but nevertheless, on net net, it works out for us. The savings for internal uh, personnel that would be required to do all the work that I mentioned before to run these services would essentially bankrupt us. Um, so here, here's a good example of, of a service that we utilize from AWS um, that we just would spend countless man hours building ourselves, monitoring, and also trying to keep running. Um, this is the AWS IoT service. This is what all of our robots connect to. I called out some of the, the features of that service. Every one of those things is a service under itself. It's got this whole HA uh, architecture underneath it um, and would be required to be maintained, monitored, et cetera. And that's just one of the 25 managed services that we use for our robot connected ecosystem. Um, because we shift all that to AWS, we can focus on these things. So this is our app. Um, you can see here, I don't treat my robot very well. The bin's full. Uh, I should treat it a little bit better. You can also see the red lines here. That's for canceled missions. That's usually because my three-year-old is at home, takes his plastic hammer, and beats the ever-loving bejesus out of the robot until it stops running. Um, so this Roomba 980 raffle has been through the ringer. Um, but the cool thing is, if you see here, uh, that's what our maps interface looks like now. So in the last two to three, four months, after moving to AWS, we were able to, within a month's time frame, release push notifications and maps after missions that are stored of your house. And this actually proves, like I, I run my robot on a schedule, I have no idea what that robot does all day. It could just sit on the dock the whole day and somebody comes in, lets himself into the house and throws a little dust in the bin and leaves. I have no idea if it even runs. Um, 
at the end of the day, when I can actually see the fact that this is my living room and kitchen and family room, uh, even I was shocked that, hey, this is actually impressive. The robot is doing what it's claiming to do. Um, so one quick word about scale. We have millions of robots that we sell a year. Not all of those are connected to the cloud, but the majority will be soon. Um, the application I just showed you there is powered by 100 plus Lambda functions, um, the 25 AWS services that I uh, mentioned before, zero unmanaged EC2 instances, um, but we also have a large development footprint. And the reason for that is AWS IoT and Cognito and a few of the other services are what we consider to be singleton services. And what that means is it's very difficult to play nicely together if you have two developers or 25 developers all working in the same AWS account. So what we end up doing is creating accounts for individual developers on the cloud team. Um, integration tests happen together, uh, other tests happen together, but uh, we end up having this kind of account sprawl because we need to support our engineers. Um, and we do all that with very few people. Um, but we can do that because there's no ops and then we all just count the money and go home. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so we do what we call kind of different ops. Um, moving to serverless is kind of like doing that first step from on-prem to EC2. You don't have to carry your screwdriver anymore. You don't have sticks of memory that you can show your friends. Oh, look at my 16 gig stick. You know, all that stuff goes away, right? But you still have to provision everything with 16 gigs memory and a bunch of disk, and you still have to back it up, and you still have to have plans for what happens when the thing breaks, and it breaks more often maybe. So it's not like you get away with anything necessarily operationally. You just have to do different things. Um, so it's easier, in many respects, you can see you can stand on the shoulders of giants, as I mentioned before. Um, but it's important to be very clear with your upper management that, hey, when we go serverless, it doesn't mean that we fire all 10 of these guys. Um, it means they all have to start doing this other stuff. Hopefully more fun stuff. So what do we actually do in operations? So at iRobot, we do the red, block, red black deployment model. And that is essentially like the Netflix model that everyone is probably familiar with. Um, they've talked about it today a little bit. Essentially, we have a copy of our application that's running. It's API Gateway. It's CloudFront. It's Lambda. It's Kinesis. It's all these buzzwords. They're all integrated talking to each other. Ben Kehoe, who's sitting here in the front row, the last serverless talked about the proprietary CloudFormation deployments that we do, that we have a, a tool that actually sews all that stuff up together and then deploys it using CloudFormation. Um, so I'm not going to go into the nitty-gritty details there, but I'm the guy who actually has to push those buttons and deploy all those things everywhere. So thank you, Ben. Um, when we do that and everything's running and everything's going great, if we want to add new features or if we want to have a different copy of the application, we actually just stand up that whole monolithic CloudFront API Gateway Kinesis all over again, call that black, and then we have some kind of service discovery mechanism or other means to move everybody from red to black. So with this slightly hopefully you can see here, is essentially just an illustration of that. All the robots are talking to one guy, boom, we put in black, everybody starts talking to black, and nobody's talking to red. You'll notice a few people keep talking to red. Don't, don't ask about that. We'll deal with that later. Um, but we're in charge of maintaining, managing that in the production environments, um, making sure that this actually works. Last point on this slide is, this touches on something somebody spoke about earlier today, I think the blue-green stuff, Ours is more like purple-brown because we have data sources that are long-lived, okay? So Dynamo doesn't go anywhere. Some of our Cognito pools don't go anywhere. Some of these other kinds of things just stay there forever. And the red and the black can coexist at the same time, talk to the same data sources as people move from one to the other. Um, so what else do we do? We do a lot of monitoring. You've heard about that today. What the heck is going on with the system? So, our primary tool for that uh, is provided by a company called Sumo Logic, um, and I'm not sure if you're aware of them or not, but they're kind of like Splunk. Uh, essentially, you can just throw any data that you want to them through HTTPS, and they will ingest it and hold it for you. The cool thing is uh, you can use their query language, and it's very forgiving, to essentially look up anything you want in all of that data. It's completely searchable. 
You can do time slices, you can do aggregations, you can the whiz bang, every, it's a very nice tool. Uh, you can see one of the dashboards that we've created with that. Um, we can also use that to generate alarms for us. So, you know, if something comes out of a uh, two standard deviation curve over time, it'll send us a pager duty, let us know that they think it's, something is wrong. Um, it's a great system. Um, and of course, we use CloudWatch as well. Um, we use CloudWatch alarms, we use the metrics, we use all of that. Um, now, some extra bits and pieces of what we do. So before I was talking about, let's deal with this red, black production deployment ecosystem of robots. We're also responsible for just making sure 80 Amazon accounts work all the time for all of our developers, all of our other um, consumers, people that are actually doing server work, unfortunately. Um, it's my responsibility to also manage all those accounts. So one of the big things, one of the takeaways for us is use ADFS if you're using AD as your Active Directory or uh, login mechanism. This has made a huge difference for us because all we have to do is define those roles within our Active Directory. We have a couple scripts that sync them up with AWS, and we have like 15 roles that our IT people, our help desk, can just place users into the roles within Active Directory. And by magic, these people now have command line access and console access to AWS. So I can't, can't say enough about it. And the second bullet point is also really important. If you're doing access keys and secret keys, eventually someone's getting that key, and you're, you're going to be compromised. So one of the mantras around uh, iRobot is to never use straight up access key and secret key. We've orchestrated everything so that we can use service accounts with AD and other means to have temporary credentials that are only good for an hour. Um, we don't have to worry about them getting compromised. Um, we also do multi-region backup with data pipeline and S3. That's a serverless thing. Not, not that exciting. Uh, the last two are kind of cool things to think about, though. S3 is a data messenger and some of the multi-account work that we do. Uh, the first one of those S3, you, you can just use it like Dropbox, basically. I'm sure a lot of other people have talked about this, but one of the things that we do uh, across all of our accounts is to say, oh, you need a key, or oh, you need a, one of the keys I said we never use, or <clears throat> any, anything else, um, great, I'll just throw it in this bucket in your account. And so we have bucket policies that are very advantageous for us to allow us to do cross-account work right out of the box. A lot of the other services, unfortunately, at this stage, don't really do cross-account uh, activity in the same way that you would expect them to. Um, and S3, they started from the beginning in allowing users to say, okay, this bucket can be accessed by everybody, or this bucket can be accessed by engineers, or this bucket can be accessed by this group of accounts. Throw stuff in there, and then it's the person's responsibility on the receiving end to write the events, to listen for new objects, to process them, to do whatever he or she wants to do with them. Um, you don't it's very loosely coupled, and you don't have to worry too much about the integration. Um, in those cases where we want someone is actually asking a question and wants to get something back right away, we've also experimented with some client-server Lambda implementations where we deploy a client Lambda to a bunch of accounts where users inside those accounts can invoke their own Lambda, their own client Lambda. That client Lambda is allowed to talk to the server Lambda. The server Lambda has very restricted permissions, has very restricted logic, and it returns, okay, here's your DNS record, or okay, here's something else. Um, but it's a little more convoluted. You have to stand the things up, keep them in sync. It's not something we do as often. Um, some more multi-account considerations. So this is where it kind of gets into the stuff that I have to do every day. Um, we've actually modified that SAML API script that was in Jeff Barr's blog a couple of years ago. Ben actually started doing that, and then we, of course, forked it right away. Now we have three different versions of it at iRobot to satisfy every constituency, uh, for us, we actually use it to, so I, I'm allowed to access all the accounts, I can actually generate keys for all the accounts at once. Then we have some scripting uh, that allows us to run basically any command that we want across our entire fleet. So you could AWS S3 LS and just look at all the buckets in all of your accounts, or you can run limit checker, that'll go and run against each account. Um, it's a very, very handy feature. One of the things it lets us do is define our entire foundational IAM role infrastructure in a JSON data structure uh, that we check into source control. It's outside of Amazon completely. And then 
idempotently we can run that across all the accounts all the time. You can use AWS config to make sure that those things are correct as well. Um, but we found that it's much easier to just check this all into source control, keep track of all the changes everyone has made to our foundational IAM in infrastructure, and then deploy it over and over and over again to make sure it's still true to what we have in source control. Um, we do the same thing with our Sumo Logic uh, infrastructure. So Sumo Logic gets all of its data through lambdas. Um, we deploy all those lambdas using the same mechanism. We can deploy them to all the accounts. So when Sandbox users say, hey, you know what, I'd really like to have some Sumo Logic logging on this, we just say, okay, great, subscribe that lambda to that log group. And it immediately starts appearing magically in Sumo Logic. That's because we can put all that infrastructure in place before we get started. Um, it's a great way to get new accounts going. You know exactly how to do it. Bring up the account, put the admin user in, run all the scripts, you're good to go. Um, and of course, you guys probably are familiar with consolidated billing. We do a similar thing. We run cron lambdas in the, in the consolidated billing account. Those look at our, bill, our bills. They say split them out by account, split them out by product code, send that over to Sumo Logic every hour, and then we're able to use Sumo Logic as our primary billing investigation tool. Um, it's also helpful. Uh, let's see. So another piece that we help with in operations is to help our developers in their operations. Um, and the cool thing about that is the closer that we are working together, the more we find out about the platform. So I watch production. I see how production's working. I, maybe the stage, I don't really look at the staging tape. So I look at production. I make sure that's all going fine. And I'm listening for people to tell me things are going wrong. Well, we have however many developers, 50 developer sandbox accounts, where people are deploying thousands of lambdas a day, hundreds of times a day. So immediately, someone will say, the build's not working. Or immediately, someone said, I just tried to compile this. This is not working. Why isn't this working for me? And before they start spinning their wheels figuring out if their environment is screwed up, we can help by saying, hey, somebody else is reporting something as well. And we can actually start to see whether or not this is a platform problem versus a problem for that particular developer. Um, and that's important because the cloud has weather. Right? No provider is immune to some kind of problems. And there are lots of these. You see the little green eyes that say increased latencies and whatever. I don't know what that is. Okay? Anytime I've seen that, I've never had a problem or nothing works. It's never been like, oh, it's just maybe kind of working. I've never seen that. Um, but those small blips, because we use 25 managed services, the risk that we take in partnering directly with Amazon and doing serverless is those SLAs are additive, right? If it's, if it's two hours down a month for Lambda, which it's not, and two hours down for Dynamo, it's four hours down for us, right? And you multiply that 25 times. So we went in with our eyes wide open with respect to that. We looked very carefully at what the historical records of all these services were. We made the determination that this was a risk we were going to take, and it's paid off big time. Uh, but it is a risk, and it's something you should think about. Architecting is key there, right? You have to be prepared at all levels of the system that something or everything won't work. And then what do you do when that happens? Um, one other piece of operations is when the cloud has this weather, I have to react and my team to the incident and say, okay, what the heck is going on? What do we do? First, like the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm, don't harm the patient, figure out what's going on. Look, what's, this is just kind of standard stuff. The second thing that we do, though, is create a ticket with enterprise support. And we do that to give them a heads up that we're actually tracking a problem. You know, Something might come out of this. Just an FYI, we're going to keep you guys up to date. Um, and then, of course, we look at the Twitterverse to see how everyone says it's all broken, and then we can say, okay, it's affecting everybody. Um, and then we start working on diagnosis. So when you're reacting to incidents, we dig in. We look at our run book. The run book says do these things. We look at CloudWatch. We look at Sumo Logic, whatever. Here's a problem. So does anyone have a story that they'd like to tell about what they think this problem represents? Any story, Goldilocks, and any story. S3 is down. It's a good guess. Any other stories about what? Well, that's part of the problem. I don't want to tell you yet. But <laughs> what if something goes like this indefinitely? That's bad. 
Hey, who is that? All right, you win the prize. That's my last record <laughs> from, from 2008, unfortunately, when, it, when I was, it's called 31. I was 31. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, that's true, it's a cue backup. So that's a, that's a kinesis stream not getting processed. Essentially, the reason that these are lambda invocations, they were happily just invocating, invo invoking, invoking, invoking all the time. When we started to get a backlog, they said, oh God, and they had to start processing the entire backlog, so they do 100 records at a time, and that's why there were fewer invocations per period for that entire time. That's as many as they could do. Um, so good. Um, so what I'm saying here is, even if it's our problem, we still talk to enterprise support. We still say, hey, we think we're doing this. Can you give us insight to what's going on? If this was a DynamoDB problem, they could tell us about the partitioning issues we might be having. We can see that ourselves with Kinesis. Um, and then we take direct action where possible. We reshard this and hope for the best. That's not a methodology, by the way. Um, I'll say, quickly, if it's the cloud, what do we do? This is when it's the most frustrating, and the rest of this talk is kind of about this more philosophically. These incidents are opaque, you're out of control of your own destiny, you feel like you do a better job, but that's not true, and it'd probably be worse. So you still have stuff you have to do, um, notify people, reach out, maintain communication with Amazon, activate plan B if you have to, if it's a so horrible outage that's gonna last for days. Um, but, but it's important to have your mind open to the fact that when it's a cloud provider problem, you will feel uh, in some ways helpless to come up with a solution. Um, and, that, and that's kind of the rest of the talk, which is to say that's the biggest downside. That the visibility that people like me normally have into a system where you can go into var log and look at dmessage and do all these other things and know everything about everything that's happening is completely evaporated and you just have to trust, what, trust what's going on. Um, how do they actually do all the stuff they do? No one knows. Um, so there are a couple of ameliorating factors, and then I'll jet off the stage here because I know we're running out of time. Um, one, obviously, is metrics. The metrics that they provide with AWS are your portal, right? There were less than 10 when they, when they started with IoT. Now I've seen accounts, I'm not sure if we're in a beta program or something, with many, many more than that. This one here has 67. Um, they're really, the service teams within AWS are really trying to make an effort to expose more to us. Lambda iterator ta ages are, are out now. There are a few others that, that have come out. Shard metrics for Kinesis. Um, the second thing, I have to give a plug here for AWS Enterprise Support, and I know that's very expensive, and it's, it's not necessarily something that everyone can do, especially in startup situations and things like that. However, they have been an invaluable resource for us. They've been our eyes and ears. Uh, literally within AWS. That S3 outage that happened, um, you know, we were on the phone with them within 10 minutes and explaining what we were seeing. We were starting to feed stuff into their pipeline so that they understood how far the problem was reaching. Um, or at least they were saying that to us to make us feel better. Uh, and, and, and it really helped us navigate that, when things were gonna be back up, how we should approach that problem. Um, did we need to pull the ripcord? Um, and they, they made all kinds of attempts to understand our architecture, and they've worked with us to develop the architecture. We've have, we have a great relationship with them. Um, and finally, first-tier support for all of our 150 users of AWS is not me. It's Amazon Enterprise Support, so they can all use the support ticketing system and everything else. So the future of how Amazon is going to make this better, we talked about the metrics, the second point there already. They're going to do more and more and more and more of those. Um, and that's a great thing. There's also this thing called the personal health dashboard, which is gonna show you your instance is messed up, or your Kinesis stream might be screwed up by this outage, or only these two Lambda functions are degraded in your account. That's gonna be a huge step forward for people in operations, because they'll be able to see, okay, I can only focus on these two things. I don't have to red black my entire infrastructure. I can just pop up these Lambda functions again. They'll die in a couple of days, and I'll be good to go. Um, so in conclusion, is it worth it? Well, two things. First of all, are operations still there? The answer is yes. But is serverless worth it for iRobot? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Um, I don't know if you saw our quarterly announcement last this week or last week, um, but a lot of the value that we've generated in the past year has been directly attrib attributable to implementing this connected ecosystem using this technology. Um, so we're really excited 
to be here to talk about it and to engage with you guys, get new ideas on how to do it better, and uh, go from there. So that's it for me.